Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Hiscox. Go to hiscoxusa.com slash smallbiz for your business insurance needs. And by Squarespace. Use the promo code TWIST10 when signing up to save 10%. You know what's right for your small business. I pick the right tools to click with my clients. When it's game time, I have the right answer, no matter the playing field. Your small business is unique. So is our coverage. Hiscox. Get the right insurance right now. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. It's Friday, so it is the News Roundtable on This Week in Startups. We've got a great all-star panel uh, again today. Dave Matthews, uh, inventor of the QCAT and many other amazing things, is with us. He's back from the demo conference, actually. Eric Renala of Mucker Labs, which is one of the elite, elite incubators, accelerators in town. And Matthew Panzerino is with us for the first time from The Next Web, a really amazing uh, publication that's getting a lot of press. Kieran's going to read the news, and Tyler Crowley, hopefully, um, will give us an insight instead of chatting with his girlfriend from Sweden. Anyway, uh, anything's possible. Stick with us. I have his computer on uh, lockdown. I have his computer on the TriCaster. So if he is doing iChat, we may actually see Tyler's girlfriend for the first time on the show. Stick with us. It's going to be amazing. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's This Week in Startups, we've got an amazing program with tons and tons of news, and uh, it's also the anniversary of Steve Jobs uh, passing, sadly, and we're going to just do a, some remembrance of that. With me on the program, Matthew Penz, uh, Reno is with us from The Next Web, first time. How are you doing, Matthew? Just fine, just fine. How are you doing, Jason? Where are you based? Uh, I'm actually in Fresno, which is a couple hundred miles east of San Francisco, so in the middle of the desert, basically. Wow. Blogging from the middle of the desert. I like it. Uh, yep. Also with us, Dave Matthews of New Air is here, and I uh, recently closed a uh, round of financing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Intel Capital saw what we were doing and said they oh. had not thought of it. I always like strategic money. Yeah. So built the product. Why that? Why do you like strategic? Because I want to be aligned with what, or obviously I want more than just cash, right? I needed some benefits out of Intel, which they make laptops, of course, Ultrabooks, and yeah. now mobile phones with Orange, and then tablets. So huh. uh, we launched in 2011 at yep. your conference, sure. one best technology. Yeah. That was nice. Tooth tag and everything, yeah. Tooth tag. And then uh, it's been a year selling the technology, so we have some people licensing it. Cool. And then Intel came in and said, we wish we would have thought of this. So oh, very good. good for me. And does that mean it's like, when, they, when someone like Intel invests, are they investing because they want to see your technology make it accelerate the growth of use of their chips? Like, is that their strategic yeah, exactly, reason? Or yep. is it because they want to eventually buy the company and they're cozying up to you and yeah, it could be. getting to know you? Yeah, I've had some people ask me what the relationship was like. Do they want to keep the valuation low or keep it high? What I love about what they're doing is they're introducing me to every business unit and every customer that they can. So mm. on Tuesday and Monday this week, we were at the CEO roundtable. There was a thousand executives from you name the company, the, yep. all the fortunes. And the, uh, they put 10 of us on stage that they just invested in, 40 million total investment in 10 companies. And man, we got carte blanche. We got yeah, invited. They got the 40 million back because all those people are going to go then go uh, buy your products and services. Yeah. Well, well done. Congratulations, Dave. And Eric Renal is here from Mucker Labs. How's everything going over at the Mucker? It's going well. We just uh, launched a new batch of companies, 11 companies in this cycle. Wow. And uh, uh, the other eight from the last batch are doing well. All of them raised follow-on financing, about a million and a half on average. You're eight for eight. Um, uh, from that batch, yeah. Eight yeah. for eight, really? Nice. I don't know that we're always going to bat a thousand, but... Uh, well, that's pretty good. And what do you attribute that to? Was it a good selection process on the way know, in, or was it just the market's really hot? What do you think? Uh, probably all of the above, I would yeah. hope, I'd like to think. And I think we try to help a lot uh, along the way as well. So we're pretty operationally focused and hands-on. It's got to feel pretty good that the other so. uh, accelerators in town, one of them did like whatever, 80%, and the other one did like a third. Kind of yeah. feels good, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I to mean, beat it feels all good. those competitors. But you know, but in reality, our goal isn't to get 100% always funded, right? Because I think if we're oh. not, you know, if if we're not seeing some drop off, we're probably not taking enough. Risk, oh, so the so. goal was not stretched enough, as we say in the management business. Perhaps, perhaps. Not yeah. a big, not a I strong mean, enough stretch goal. We're, we're obviously happy. You're only supposed to hit 70% if you're really pushing hard. Exactly. Yeah. So I think. You so know, basically, we're happy you're saying that the, there was nothing really particularly out there and innovative. <laughs> well, I think. I mean, that would be one good. argument, right? Like, it's too easy. It, to, is it too easy to fund, or did you not do big enough audacious ideas? that confuse angels. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there were some pretty big audacious ideas, and those got funded, like Surf Air, for example. Is a that's big audacious. audacious. I love that. That's yeah. such a great idea. So. Yeah, I love the fact that those guys didn't take my money. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Not that I keep track of such things. <laughs> hey, whoever's run the TriCaster, when I look at the TriCaster and I do that, that's my signal. Too. That means I want my close-up. Hmm. Surf Air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Surf Air. And no. Black Mark. No. Yes. No to Jason. Okay, keep going. So Surfer, yeah, that was incredibly innovative. What a great idea <laughs> that I didn't get to invest in. Keep going. What else? So they Why did they not take my money? I have no idea. Jake, how money no good? I'm going to have to talk no to him about that. Jake, how money no good? <laughs> no, no, Jake, how money good? Jake, how money good? I'll Unbelievable. Have to, I'll have to talk to him. Okay, that's fine. So, I'm just, I'm just busting chops. Um, but I really do want to try it. I mean, I'll probably yeah. become a customer. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, I mean, Explain the concept of Surfer and why that, that's captured people's imagination. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a membership-based subscription airline, so it's kind of a semi-private airline where you, where you pay a monthly yeah. subscription. You fly on private planes, private airports, so it's kind of the private aviation experience that's really out of reach for everyone, but brought down to a mass market price point with a subscription. And the price point is twelve hundred dollars a month, fourteen hundred a month. For yeah, six, it's, uh, six flights, right? You can book two flights at a time with the fourteen hundred. With the thousand. Give, with a thousand. Uh, with a thousand, okay. you can have two res- four reservations outstanding at any, any given time. Uh, Eight hundred uh, is two reservations, and then. Six and the with, idea is they're going to fill up. So, yeah. and it's going to be yeah. basically the Southwest corridor: San Francisco, L.A. Yeah, right Vegas. now they're starting with uh, L.A., San Francisco, or L.A. Bay Area, and then they'll do uh, Santa so Barbara and Monterey in between as well. It's exactly for us. The first route is for uh, for us. And yeah. they haven't started yet. They haven't. They have the planes. They uh, they're they still, need to get that certification. I yeah, the FAA. FAA is something that you can't sort of speed up or slow down very easily. Yeah. So and they're using uh, the they Pilatus plane, which is Pilatus a Swiss-made PC-12s. plane, which has ext- got one of the best safety records ever, even though it it's does. a turboprop. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic plane. And, and using turboprops, I mean, for, especially for distances like that, you it's get the there in as just jet. as much time and, and they're uh, much fifth. cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is that an eight-seater? Uh, eight or nine, depending on configuration. They're doing eights, mostly. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Hey, listen, and if you're going to run uh, a small business, one thing you need is Hiscox Small Business Insurance. And it was amazing. Last week, we had uh, Chris Saka on the program, famously. And what a great show. Thank you. You watched it? Yeah, wow, that's great. It. Um, I love when the guests actually watch yeah. the show. Um, and the part two is coming out, I think, this Tuesday. But he needed small business insurance, and he forwarded me the fact that he got small business insurance. And then another high-profile person did it and tweeted it. Who was that? Does anybody remember? Somebody asked Jason DeMont or whatever. But anyway, another like famous, famous person was like, I heard your ad for Hiscox, and I bought it. So, I mean, uh, do I have to even read the ad? Chris Saka bought Hiscox insurance. Chris Saka, <laughs> Hiscox. Jason Calcanis, Hiscox, other famous people. They just go there, they sign up, and it just works. And hey, listen, go to their blog, read their blog. They spend a lot of time and effort uh, trying to cover and tackle the topics that you care about. So go to HiscoxUSA.com and click on their blog and uh, read there my startup story. It uh, features top entrepreneurs like the founders of Clout, Hey, Mashable, and Tumblr um, discussing their ideas and how they became successful. And they really want to get you to read that because um, it's great advice from founders, just like on this program. And Saka had my favorite quote when we oh, launched New Air. He said, we've created a script. Oh, is he on your judging panel? Yeah, he was on the panel. Oh, very good. He said, we created a scripting language for the real world. And as a geek, how yeah, cool that? Yeah, that was a pretty cool. That's yeah, pretty dope. Yeah, that's pretty good. Way to make it about yourself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well as my wife well, said, well played. way to yeah. make it about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, oh, wait uh, a second. His cox insurance <laughs> is to Chris Saka as Chris Saka is to me <laughs> and my products. This is the thing. Entrepreneurs constantly, oh, yeah. A-B-S. Oh, A-B-S. Yeah. Always, always B. be. <laughs> Selling, selling. Uh, and closing, ABC, <laughs> ABS, always be selling, always be closing, yeah, that's right. And go to HiscoxUSA.com slash smallbiz, HiscoxUSA.com small biz, and click on the small business blog under useful information. Follow them on Twitter and Facebook at Hiscox small biz. What, great, uh, what a great team, and it's so, so easy to sign up for small business insurance. And if you're doing all your guys, you make sure all your startups have insurance, right? Yeah, they have to. Yeah. They have to. It's a requirement. Well, it's not a requirement from us, but I mean, if the, for, depending on what they're doing, most of them need it. So, yeah, and yeah. especially when you start getting investors, yeah. then it becomes they required. Really need it. Yeah. Some of my yeah. contracts required it. 
So oh, really? To do a deal with some of these bigger companies, yeah. you have to yeah. have insurance. So. Way to make it a so, <laughs> so annoying. For New Air. My, so my company, many New Air. For New Air? Need, yeah, yeah. New Air is actually hiring. I don't know if we oh, talked about that. Yeah. Right, N-E-W-A-E-R.com. Oh, I got to stop saying kill yourself. All the people in the suicide lobby then email me. Okay, listen. Um, thank you, Hiscox. <laughs> uh, oh, Steve Jobs. Wow. I kind of, I, I'm torn about this issue, and I want to get the feedback from the audience and from the, from the panel. Should we celebrate the death of Steve Jobs like we're doing or memorialize it, or should we do his birthday or something? Because I kind of feel, like, obviously it's on everybody's minds. Everybody's tweeting about it. And everybody's tweeting and talking about the death of Steve Jobs because he meant so much to us. But I do think we might want to think about Maybe like the day he founded Apple or something maybe better than... It kind of bums me out to think about his death. Mm. Are you bummed out about it? I mean, you're an inventor. You, want to keep you it... must be super bummed. He well, was your hero, right? Um, you know what I liked about him? He, he chartered his own course, right? A lot of times inventors, right, most inventors have that A-type personality that are yeah. so annoying that they're, they're, you know, like push, push, push yeah. to the end. So, um, but he was... He started with a computer company that no one liked, no one bought, and then he was the most valuable company right before he passed away. Yeah. Right? Beat all the oil companies that normally hit those yeah, top yeah. 10 slots. Yeah. Apple went up to number one right yeah. before passing. So how cool is that, right? That's such a great legacy. It was, yeah, it's such an incredible legacy on all levels. Hey, let's play a clip. We got a clip? We do. The first Which one, clip we play? this is actually uh, my it favorite. It is now 1984. Oh, that's It appears one. IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly and desperately turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry, the entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? <laughs> so great. That's so awesome. <laughs> he was such a gangster. That's from... When was that? 1983, when he introduced the 1984 ad. Yep. And uh, wow, you just like, he knew how to fight, you know? He's like such mm -hmm. a great competitor. It's kind of laughable that IBM would now like, yeah, right. dominate the information age. Like IBM was just like, yeah, we'll just take the easy money being a consulting yeah. uh, a company. What do you think, Matthew? Uh, now we're, uh, disc what do you think of, you know, legacy of Steve Jobs and, and watching that video? What do you think? Oh, I mean, the, the video, that, that's just one of those demonstrations of, um, you know, practice uh, and perfection. I mean, he's, you know, obviously he was a great speaker, but that kind of performance doesn't happen, you know, naturally. I mean, he obviously, you know, rehearsed that very well, but um, it just, it's just a testament to how much of that actually came from his brain that when reporters talk to him casually, like, you know, you see videos where people are grilling him on stage or, or casually in person or catching him off the cuff at like an event. And still that message comes out the same way. It's not exactly as well rehearsed. You know, there's a little, there's ums and uhs yeah. and maybe some stuttering, but the force of personality is there. So yeah. that persona you see on stage is, is a polished and perfected version of that, but it's the real version. It's, 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 real it's authentic. Person. He authentically... Right felt that way he authentically felt like he was in a always felt like he was in a battle for his life and like he made it into like it was like it's just computers you know but he made it into such a personal freedom everything which was also kind of ironic and you know in later life kind of hypocritical that he had such a lockdown operating system and you mm -hmm. know you know was so anti-open when you hear him talking about it I think a lot of people only know the gorgeous products, you know, yeah. most people on the planet. Just yeah. think about the gorgeous products. They don't realize that he had this huge battle for just the life of his company and that he was this, like, gnat on, you know, just buzzing around this huge lions like Microsoft. Yeah. And, but he yeah. said that because he had control of both the operating system and the hardware, he was able to give the right experience for the people. Right. And then he was he, a benevolent dictator in that yeah. way. Yeah. When yeah. he gave us the neutered tablet, the first iPad, I hated it. Yeah. A year later, it was great. All those apps. He was, it is like, they say that the best form of government is a benevolent dictatorship. Nice. They do say that. Like, that it actually operates the most efficiently yeah. with, because think about it. If you have a dictator who is incredibly benevolent, 
they're going to um, not have corruption and lobbying and all the things that we have in a democracy. Yeah. It's just that it never things quite will works. Things actually get done because someone's they, in oh, charge, of course. Somebody's right? like, yeah, just build it's that road. It's not like a direct democracy where everyone's yeah. going to be, you know, it's going to be gridlock, right? Nothing will right. get done, but... Uh, Hyper-efficient and whatever. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's see the next uh, clip. Let's do, which clip are we going to do, Karen? Which one do we want to do? Uh, I'd like to do the Stanford commencement speech uh, next. Ah, yeah, Stanford commencement one. speech. Let's hear that. Uh, wow, that's a great one. Because Good. believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. That was too short, man. We need to play a little bit more of that. Keep playing. Or actually, you know what? You got to cue up the part about... Um, he had that part where he was talking about following your dreams. Yeah. I can't remember which one. But anyway, um, everybody's seen that speech. Is that your yeah. favorite? That's my favorite, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can see, you know, right in his own backyard, it was kind of... Was it a surprise, or there was something... There's some setup behind that story that I don't really remember. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but it, it almost is. I think he, you know, we, um, Matthew mentioned earlier, like he's, he's very prepared and he's scripted and it's authentic, but mm -hmm. it was authentically strategic, you know? Yeah. And it's pretty clear to me, he gave that after he knew he had cancer. Yeah. And, um, and he knew that the legacy was going to key off of some moments in time, like his keynotes. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to have his grand vision of life, his philosophy of life captured. Yeah. Yeah. He had to have written that and performed it and studied it as this will be the thing that people remember me by. Because that speech, I think, uh, I mean, uh, an iPhone 5 launch is going to look, you know, sort of dorky in yeah. the, in the annals of history. Yeah. Yeah. But his philosophy of life... Yeah, so it's the big picture, right? I mean, it's, it, it sums up uh, my favorite things about his personality, too. Everything he did, he was, mission, he was on a mission, right? right? I mean, that's why he was so passionate about the products and the experience. And, um, you know, that's, that's the way I like to remember him as being on a mission to really build great things. And it's, it's transferable to whatever anyone's doing, but be passionate about what you're doing and be on a mission and, and you know, don't, uh, don't compromise. So. Yeah, don't compromise, but also there has to be some balance, too. You know, I think there's yeah. probably some lessons there that you don't get from Steve directly in what he says, but that when you, if you've read the autobiography or you've looked at his life, a lot of things he did that he regretted, you know, yeah. whether it's relationships with certain people uh, or even with the cancer. I mean, there's a pretty big contingent of people who think that he might have been with us today or a little bit yeah. longer if he had just not been so headstrong about listening to alternative people. Yeah, no, by far, I mean, for sure he wasn't, no, none of us are perfect, I guess, but, yeah. um, but that speech, I think, is a, is a great one about really um, following what you're passionate about. Let's do the last one, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, end, we'll wrap up this tribute to Steve. Um, the last one is The Crazy Ones, which I think is my favorite. Apple, at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And we've had the opportunity to work with people like that. We've had an opportunity to work with people like you, with software developers, with customers who have done it in some big and some small ways. And we believe that in this world. People can change it for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. And going to Matt's point, you know, he's, t I mean, he's, t he's talking to partners there. That wasn't the commercial. Yeah. I, I'm thinking that was, uh, you know, one of his off-the-cuff, you know, uh, talks to developers or partners. But he actually is sort of inspiring them to, like, hey, be crazy. Try to change the world. Then you can make a dent in it. And that whole Think Different campaign, you know, spurred from that, right? Yeah. I mean, and I love the, the part about the Think Different campaign I love was he, he originally recorded Voiced the it. commercial. Yeah, exactly. And then they were like, yeah, let's use, what's his name? Um... Uh, Richard, Dreyfus? Richard Dreyfus, you know, and it's like the Richard Dreyfus one is obviously done more professionally, but not as good as Steve's. Let's see, I have that here on my computer. Here's to the crazy one. So this is the misfits, the crazy the ones. rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. 
And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. It's probably the best commercial ever made. I mean, ever. pretty. It's pretty much the best commercial ever. Did you made. see the Hiscox ad on YouTube right next to? Oh wow! It was I so get <laughs> serendipitous. <laughs> no, you know what I think that is? Is obviously if I pulled up the website, that's retargeting. Um, yeah. And then you think the same little, little cookie monster action going there? I think it's retargeting, definitely. Okay. Nice. I mean, I, you it's know, it's that. I mean, I notice um, how often that happens. Now it cannot be yeah. coincidence. And then of course, Steve Jobs doing. Have you ever had Deja? Deja? Oh, Deja, look at this. And then here's... Deja that's for, interesting. I try to play... I, I try Steve to play the Steve Jobs version, <laughs> and Samsung has bought the head. Uh, oh. Ugh. God, the, it's just like, <laughs> will the internet and retargeting kill themselves, please? Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And Tyler obviously getting emotional. Did you just wipe a tear over there? I, I got a tear over the irony of the fact that now you would be, uh, you could use this against Apple if you were a new computer company. What? The fact that it's the dominant thing. His whole point, you know, he was the underdog, which is why this worked. Yeah. Now there's nothing thinking different about using Apple. Every freaking buddy and their brother's using Apple. Yeah. It's, California. you know, so one, it's one of the things about leading a revolution is that sometimes you actually do change the world and then the, it gets, you know what it's, it's kind like? of anticlimactic, well, then right? Then you become the status quo. And then right? you become yes. the status quo and then like, how do you push yourself past that? It's like you the know. dog catching the ambulance. <laughs> it's like the dog catching. Yeah. Well, Matthew, which one do you like better? You like the uh, Steve Jobs or you like well, the I don't know. I've, I've always wanted to hear the original Phyllis Diller recording. I mean, that's, you know, did you know that? That's who Steve Jobs wanted? Phyllis, Phyllis Diller. Diller? I, I'm not joking. You know Ken Seagal, who, who worked for Kayat Day for a long time? He yeah, um, a wrote a book called Insanely Simple recently. Yeah. And uh, they said that, uh, or he said that the uh, Jobs originally wanted Phyllis Diller. They brought her in and did some test recordings. And she was like, you know, quiet and getting ready and just right up to the mic. And she's all, here's to the crazy ones. <laughs> And like they just, they were, they went crazy because her voiceover was just manic, you know. And Ken was like, maybe, maybe not, you know. And they, then they, uh, of course, end up uh, going with Dreyfus. But I don't even know. Um, if, obviously, what does Phyllis Diller sound like? Thank you very much. You think I'm overdressed? This is my slip. <laughs> I got a figure that just won't start. My body's in such bad shape. I wear prescription underwear. <laughs> I get what he was going. Actually, no. You know, now that I hear it, I kind of get what he was going for. She's kind of yeah, like. Mean, if, if they could have given her to deliver like a measured performance, you know, maybe. But she's got that like sarcastic, you know, abrasive. Mm -hmm. Like here's yeah, to the crazy manic. ones. Yep. I mean, it's not the people create. You know, whatever. Anyway, listen. Um, There's also one other. Did you hear the new Steve Jobs uh, audio clip that came out? Yeah, somebody had a cassette ago. tape, the lost tape. It's yeah, awesome. I listened to the first third. It's like he's like predicting everything. He and, predicts everything and, with yeah. such accuracy. I don't, I can't think of yeah. anything else. Steve Stradamus. Exactly. Yeah. Very much yeah. a Steve Stradamus kind of thing. He's Rather like, mind blowing. It's mind. easy to predict the future though when you're inventing it. It's a pretty good point. And uh, Tyler, speaking, you should have said that. Yeah, well, that wouldn't be an insight. <laughs> it's more like a, it's more like a quip. But hey, listen. Um, obviously, we all miss Steve and. Uh, yeah, it's just, I, I, in a certain extent, it's not the same without him, but in a certain extent, I feel like everybody's building off of that momentum, and it's like, it, it almost gives you some sort of, like, hope in humanity that, like, you know, somebody as great as him can pass, and then people can celebrate it and move on, 
and still create awesome stuff. Like Apple is still making great stuff, yeah. and they're still like kicking ass over there. Look and at other the stock people, price. have you seen the stock price? Yeah, and then like Tesla is and... like, you know, Elon Musk is like, yeah, I'm gonna put char charging stations across the world that are free, and so everybody will drive for free. You know, like it's almost like the crazy that Steve Jobs had has infected so many other nice. people. Don't you feel that way? Yeah, I like it. I feel like it's infected everybody. The, like everybody's like, I need a bigger mission. I need something bigger. I need to have more passion. Yeah. No, I mean, I think a lot of the the biggest ideas end up or you know are crazy or sound crazy in the beginning, right? I mean, sure. the best, some of the biggest companies and best ideas sound like stuff that ninety nine percent of people would think are insane when they making first... a computer easy to use, for, easy enough for anybody on the planet to use in nineteen seventy yeah. whatever, or or even Bill Gates putting a computer or on a, every a private house. space company sending spaceships into yeah. space, right? Going SpaceX, to Mars, going you know, to Mars, going to Mars. I mean, hey, it's crazy. And hey, here's something that you'd be crazy not to use. Square, <laughs> a good segue or no, Tyler? No. Okay, thanks for the vote you of confidence. Could say, Speaking of crazy, no, it doesn't no, it doesn't, work. No, doesn't work. It's not, no, no, no easy way to do it. No, hey, no, listen, Squarespace is uh, a great product. I use it, and it is the best product for creating beautiful, professional-looking websites. Squarespace version six has just been launched, and you can make gorgeous experiences that work. And I've been showing you these over the uh, weeks. I can go over here and pull up my website on my browser, and then if you pull up the iPad here, and these beautiful websites will uh, publish once to iPad, to iPhone, and be gorgeous wherever you look at them. And that's what you're looking for right now. You don't want to leave behind the 50%, the one-third, the two-thirds sometimes, depending on what type of business you're running, who are consuming your content and your small business, medium-sized business, large businesses website uh, on mobile. And if you purchase a yearly or bi-yearly plan, you'll get 20% off. Go to Squarespace. Slash dot com slash twist T W I S T and try it out for free two weeks no credit card required and if you wind up um, continuing which you will enter the code twist ten and get uh, a checkout time and you get another ten percent off again that code twist ten it's very important that you use it I know that you can afford to not even use the code but you're doing me a big favor by using the code twist ten because it signals to them that hey you guys are listening to uh, the program and you're trying out the great products. Um, including Squarespace. I've used the product. I've used it for years. It's gorgeous. It's buttery. It's perfect. I say beautiful website. Tyler says. <laughs> Squarespace. I say Squarespace, and Tyler says. Buttery website. Thank um. you. <laughs> Thank you. You can be in, I'm going to give you Tyler's spot from now on. Buttery website. Buttery, delicious, gorgeous website. Okay, let's go to the news. What's the first news story? All right, Jason. The first story, you got to talk about Facebook hitting a billion monthly users. Sure. And, of course, they also took this as the occasion to debut their own uh, ad, Things That Connect. And oh. so I think we can have an interesting discussion there about how their ad compares to what Apple used to do. Uh, but some of the interesting things that came out around this, um, Facebook has 1,000 engineers. That's basically one engineer for every million users. Um, Andreessen told uh, Mark Zuckerberg that probably the only other companies in the world with a billion customers are Coke and McDonald's. Uh, now, for, for Zuckerberg, the big question is what services can be built on Facebook's infrastructure. He thinks commerce is going to be the next big push. Um, he also oh, mentioned... Perfect. 600 million are using Facebook on phones, um, and he expects long-term that they will make more money for each user um, based on the time spent on mobile. Anybody see the ad? The Facebook ad on uh, YouTube? Anybody see it? Mm -hmm. I did. It's terrible. Let me, what's, uh, the, what's the topic of the ad? I, I'll play a little bit of it. It's Well, I'll let you guys tell me what you think, but I, I kind of felt this was uh, almost like dystopian... Like, um, what was the film that really Scott just did? Um, the Prometheus. Dire the director of the, of, of the particular commercial in question is uh, Alejandro González Inarito, who did Amores Peros. Oh, God, really? They made him do this? What a sellout. It took them a year to put it together, and they decided that this was the right time to do it, sort of as a capstone to the one billion thing. Yeah, I mean, I understand why they would have him do it. I can't even find Facebook's channel. I have um, the link there in the uh, in the oh, you do? show okay, notes. Oh, sorry, on. I could, there it is, Facebook's official channel. The oh, here we go. The things that connect us. Chairs. Chairs are made so that people can sit down and take a break. Anyone can sit on a chair. And if the chair is large enough, they can sit down together and tell jokes 
or make up stories or just listen. Chairs are for people. And that is why chairs are like Facebook. Doorbells, airplanes, bridges. These are things people use to get together so they can open up and connect about ideas and music and other things that people share. Dance floors, basketball, a great nation. A great nation is something people build so they can have a place where they belong. The universe. It is vast and dark. Oh my god, this is way wonder. too heady. I can't watch this anymore. Turn this off. So this is no, just like saying going. This going. Is like saying Facebook is the operating to system to the ourselves. internet oh, and the world. <laughs> Facebook is the universe, or the universe is Facebook. I mean, oh, this could easily be a parody ad. So terrible. I mean, yeah. I mean, just tell me exactly how bad it is. Go ahead, Matthew. So, so, so bad. Okay. Um, so what is it? Is Facebook the chair, the nation, the tree? The globe. I think they're the basketball court. The basket. Sure. Is it the basketball court? <laughs> no, are they is the is basketball court of the universe? Facebook yeah, or the universe? Well, yeah. I thought they were the airplane. <sighs> so lame. This yeah. is, Facebook is yesterday's news. It's the biggest time suck on the planet. And um, there's no redeeming feature except to see how fat your ex-girlfriend from high school got. Wow. How do you really feel? Uh, I guess that's that a, was brutal. A unanimous thumbs down on the on the so ad. So bad. So uh, Matthew, bad. what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I'm not as hard on the ad as a lot of people have been. I mean, I think I understand what they're trying to do with it. You know, they're presenting it as something that's um, automatic. You know, I mean, everybody's got a chair. Everybody's got Facebook. I mean, that's a double-edged sword because you're also painting Facebook as boring, right? Mm -hmm. As uh, a chair. I mean, who cares about a chair, really? You right. use them but you're not really all that excited about using them. You use them because you have to have something to sit on. Toilet and, paper. Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. And, Spoons. And, you know, the, it works for half of Facebook's strategy, which is to present themselves as infrastructure, right? Pens. Like they, they you know, Zuck wants to present himself or present Facebook as infrastructure for the web, as a layer that people can use to build things on. Yeah, so is and so AOL. We half. see where that went. But the problem is they're, they're pitching that to customers. Whereas that message needs to be pitched to developers because people don't care about infrastructure. Yeah. They care about product. It's a very good and point. And I think that commercial is pointing towards the infrastructure. Well, here's the difference. The this, this show is exactly the difference between Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. Steve Jobs would look at that commercial and say to the person who presented to him, are you a fracking idiot? You stupid mother fracker. <laughs> Get the F out of my office. I am going to murder you and your family and burn your house <laughs> to the ground. How dare you show me something so stupid. That is the stupidest commercial ever. Facebook. It's like pens. It's like a phone. It's like a poi pounder. It's like the swear jar. I mean, what the F is it? It's the worst commercial ever. Oh. And that's their first commercial? They've literally, now it's like, this shows you. Steve Jobs created... The best commercials, the, the two best commercials ever created, number one and number two, yep. are Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs. And we can debate if it's 1984 or the crazy ones, which one's better. And then Zuckerberg has made the worst commercial in the history. It absolutely shows you that Facebook is not long for this world, and it is complete garbage, and it is, in fact, dying a slow death on the vine because young people hate it. Yeah, Everybody it, hates it now. Yeah. In Instagram in Sweden, they're not even on Facebook anymore. So Tyler and I were running around the hills, like the sound of music, it was amazing. And everyone in Sweden loves Instagram. Oh, really? They're all Instagram? Yes. Interesting. They're on I know. What do you think of this commercial, Tyler? I haven't seen it yet. I just played it. I don't see the back. I'm watching oh, the back. Oh, you're, you're in your corner. We put you, we put, we put baby in a corner, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> well, what do you think of this concept of pens, chairs, Facebook is like these I was these about things. to watch the video. It, from what I could see, I couldn't see the visuals. All yeah. I could hear it. It sounded rather, the closest thing you could compare it to was some of those early Apple commercials you were playing. Well, see, this is the thing. I think he was going for that, like going for the gravitas. Yeah. Except if you actually don't authentically have something to contribute to the universe, what that was telling me, this is why I think it's dystopian, when they say like nation state, you know, like countries and, th you know, dance floors, it was almost like they were trying to program us like you do like facebook you <laughs> like it like you like donuts like you like chairs like you like mommies like you like puppies facebook is something that you need and you like it was like manchurian candidate level trying to brainwash you 
Yeah, it, Garbage. What do you think, Aaron? I mean, it seems like they were going for the Apple, but they fell way, way short, right? I think that was what they Comically were aspiring short. to, but it fell completely flat. I thought it was a college humor bit, and this took yeah, a year. It could have took, took a year. It could have easily been a parody ad. Well, I mean, I mean listen, mean, Zuckerberg is trying to rip off Steve Jobs. Like, he, and he, like the week of Steve Jobs' death, he's got to come out and say, I wear the same thing every day. Oh, wow, how original of you. You wear the same perfect shirt every day. The difference is he wears a shirt from Old Navy every day. And Steve Jobs wore one from a famous designer in Japan. Yep. And he had sought it out and found it. And Steve Jobs had taste. And Zuckerberg has whatever the antithesis of taste is. Like, if they just, if there was a mental disease where they took out your ability to understand flavor, there must be some disease like that where you just, you put something in your mouth, you don't even know if it's salty or sweet. That's that miracle fruit. That's what Zuckerberg has. <laughs> Zero taste. And this proves it. It proves it. All right, thank you for tuning yep. into this. Start up. <laughs> it's such a terrible commercial. Right, well, it's Jason, laughable. Let's get back to the, the, the hey, other I issue thought, of okay, the... Here's my other point. I thought it was a college humor joke. Yeah. Because I, I saw it like in the, you know, I guess they were paying for ads or something on, so it came up in one of the sponsored slots, I think. And I saw it, and I'm like watching it, and I'm like, I think that this is a college humor. Like, I'm waiting for the punchline. Like, when is this going to get funny? And it just got stupider and stupider. And it was almost yeah. like they're putting like the Coldplay, like piano, yeah. melodic music to it. And it just never got anywhere. It's just. Do you think this will be parodyized? Like, oh, if, God. if Saturday Night Live will do something or. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. If the chair is large enough, anyone could sit on a chair. And if it's big enough, they could sit together. That's amazing. That's profound. Now, let me just <laughs> think about how profound that is. I'm trying to, Matthew. Anybody can sit in a chair, Matthew. And two people could sit in a chair if it's big enough. Whoa, look at Matt. Look, look at his reaction. Oh, it's like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> two people, Matthew. If the chair is big enough, two people could sit in it. Uh huh. Do you understand? <laughs> no. All right, let me just play a little bit more for you. It'll become clear. Hold on one second. Just okay. Matthew's no, new to the show. Can we please go to the next no, story? No, no, no. no. We're giving Matthew's going to get it. We're giving Hold them on. way too much. Pay attention, Matthew. You concentrating, Matthew? I am. I'm paying attention. Okay, pay attention. Here we go. And tell jokes. Or make up stories. Or just listen. All right. Hold on. You can tell jokes in a chair. You can make up stories. Or... You can just listen, Matthew. Now, do you understand what the point is? Concentrate, Matthew. <laughs> you know, I think the problem... I, I don't. I don't. Give it to me straight. Okay. I think the listen, problem is Matthew is not being the chair. You have to be the chair. There are chairs, Matthew. And uh -huh. you can sit in them, but two right. people can also sit in them. And when you sit right. in them... Uh-huh. You getting it now? When we're sitting in the chairs, you could tell uh -huh. a story... Or you could listen to the story. You understand what right. I'm saying? Are you getting it? <laughs> like, how does this? I mean, I, how do, how are they pitching this to to people? I don't understand. Give me one more minute. Okay. Now I want you to really concentrate, Matthew. <laughs> just concentrate for just five seconds. Ready? Concentrate, please. <laughs> please concentrate. Chairs are for people, and that is why chairs are like Facebook. Doorbells. Airplanes, bridges. Okay. <laughs> Chairs are for people just like Facebook and bridges. Now do you understand, Matthew? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to understand. We already have lots of chairs and lots of bridges and airplanes. So why do we need so Facebook? So I guess we don't need Facebook. Exactly. That's good. All right, listen. Anyway, I just want to say it's... I think this is really, I, somebody very, 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 very famous, more famous than anybody who's ever been on the program, I was talking to. And he said of his meeting with Zuckerberg, which occurred not too long ago, but a little bit ago, he said he was so underwhelmed that there was absolutely nothing there, that Zuckerberg had absolutely nothing to contribute to the conversation or nothing like insightful or interesting to say, that he was shocked that he had the level of success he had with nothing to say. Literally nothing to say. Nothing, no insight into the world, no grand vision or anything like that. This company is going to crash and burn. It's built on vanity, though. So, right, when you have 
vanity is your sole purpose, uploading pictures and showing people party pics and what you did last night? Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. no substance. Yeah, it's like Steve Jobs had this grand vision, like, I'm going to make computers easy for people to yeah. use, and it's going to make their lives better. And Zuckerberg's vision is, I'm going to connect everybody so that I can make a lot of money and have all this information on them, and then they're going to start behaving the way my very immature mind thinks that human beings should behave. Like, I'm going to reprogram their behavior, and then how dare he put out this stupid ad that's just so insulting. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know what? I took a year off from bashing Facebook, and I'm back. You're back. Well, Keep... just this ad makes me so infuriated. I don't know why <laughs> this ad is making me so mental. Does this, does this upset you more than the idea that people will pay $7 to promote their own post? That is another insane thing. Read that story. Well, I, I didn't oh put it in Jesus. here, but, but that's, that's basically the gist. This is something that they started testing uh, in May in New Zealand. It's already in 20 countries, and it started in the U.S. just this week. So you can actually pay to promote your own post. So if you want to make sure everybody who's friends with you sees that you just got engaged or that your baby just had the first birthday or that you got a new job or whatever it is you think is important about you that everyone should know, you can pay to promote it. All right. So basically, Facebook hits a billion people, and then they launch paper post. Remember Paper Post, which I went on tirades about, and I had that stupid Ted Murphy on the program, and I wrote my, I had Tyler write my name on his forehead for $100. A thousand. A thousand dollars, whatever we paid him, like, to prove exactly how stupid it was that people should pay to promote to their friends like this. And now they've come up with this as that, at every, what is everybody complaining about about Facebook right now, Matthew? What's the number one complaint about Facebook, Matthew? You saw the Privacy? Video. Privacy... Well, timeline, no. they converted everyone to timeline now. Right, I so, guess maybe but, a little yeah. bit about privacy, but it's the inaneness of the timeline, the news feed. Yeah. And then, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the lowest common denominator nature of everything that streams by, it's just like it's bland, garbage. all of it's bland. It's all yeah. garbage. People say, oh, God, it's bland, it's nothing there. It's noise, yeah. It's noise. It's a waste of time. But the paper post is ridiculous. So it's how terrible. do we make that better, right, Matthew? Yeah. Hi, I'm yeah. Miriam, yeah. And You and pay I'm for it, right. Posts. Yeah. Look at the stupidity. Look at this stupidity. For any eligible post, it's an easy and fast way to reach more of the people who like your page and their friends. People will currently see your promoted posts as a sponsored story in their newsfeed on desktop or mobile. When people like, comment, share, their friends will see the post too. Here's how to promote your post. Choose solid content. When you promote a post from your page, it's seen by more people than a regular post is. Ugh. You want the content to be really it's fun. just insufferable. Like, really? Like, I'm going to post my wedding announcement and pay $7. So are they really targeting no, this that was for individuals? Well, this is for a sandwich, sandwich store, shop, but they, yeah. the way they're targeting it is... Right, for individuals. This is promoted yeah, post. I pulled, up the, uh, I pulled up the wrong thing. This is not the individual version. I'll show you the individual. I mean, it would seem embarrassing. That it sounds like they're going to actually mark them as sponsored posts, right? Uh. So Well, I don't know if that video... The video I played is not what I think it is, but here it is. Look, this is... This is what they used as their example. This is what they sent to the press. Excited to announce that Elizabeth and I are engaged to be married. Promote. Really? You don't have enough friends who are liking your... If, you're, if your friends are not liking and commenting, congratulating you on your engagement enough to do it, you probably should not have just gotten engaged to that person. <laughs> If, if you have to pay $7 to get your friends to see I, it. I would think people would be embarrassed <laughs> about having a sponsored post for their, uh, yeah. you know, for their engagement. Well, maybe Facebook there. says that people used to take these ads out in the newspaper and spend you know, wedding announcements. Uh, or I don't know about that. Obits, whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can we go to an, another bad story? Like, All right, let's move Zynga? on. Let's move on. Go to else who's All right, let's Zynga. do Zynga. <laughs> All right, we'll do Zynga. We'll do Zynga. I know Jason's they tie got something to say about this one. Yeah. So hand. as you all probably know by now, Zynga has lowered its outlook for 2012. It also announced its expected uh, Q3 revenue, 300 to 500, 305 million, and a net loss of 90 million to 105 million. And a big part of that, of course, is going to be the OMG pop acquisition that they're writing down, expected to be between 85 and 95 million. That means, in other words, that the 180 million they paid for it six months ago, it has lost about half of its value. Right. They got half back. Or they whatever. Got, yes. And then. Because they um, have some amount of revenue coming in from that. Right. Because it was making a quarter million dollars a day or a half million dollars a day at the well, peak. Well, I don't I think people are playing draw something the way they were six months OMG ago. OMG pop? Yeah. yeah I, don't th I don't think anymore, probably. Not yeah. anymore, but no. at the peak, it was a half million dollars a day, right. I understood. And so, hmm. you know, this this caused such an uproar that Mark Pincus himself wrote a post <coughs> um, saying that, you know, they've lowered the guidance because of the web games having reduced performance. Several new games might launch late. Um, but he did want to be overall positive. He says the With Friends franchise is defining social play on mobile. He said Farmville 2 is their most successful launch. 
launched since Castleville, which came out last fall. So I guess, you know, was buying OMG Pop worth it? And why do you think they're behind? What, what's going on? Uh, Matthew, any thoughts? Zynga? Well, I mean, you know, the acquisition at the time, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of us called it on day one. It's like you're buying this at the very peak of its popularity, right? So, you know, they're buying the users, so that's good, I guess. But I don't know how you, I don't know how you translate a casual games user into an ecosystem user. Like, yes, you make other casual games, but by their very nature, those users are flighty, right? They play whatever their friends are playing, whatever happens to catch on. And does, that doesn't mean it's another Zynga property. So I just don't, I never saw the value from day one in that purchase, you know? I mean, they're buying at the peak of its popularity, and then what? You know, it's, it's going to go down from there. This was a one-hit wonder company as well. When you look at all the stuff they built, like Tapulous had the same problem. They had Tap Tap Revenge to the one, two, three power. Yeah. They had special versions of Tap Tap Revenge. Yeah. And I kept bugging the CEO when I'd see him. I say, I want to design your next game because you're a one-hit wonder. And finally, he relented, and we did a new game. But right. um, Disney bought that company, uh, but they kind of turned that into a mobile strategy play. So, it is a risk when you're ma it, like a movie studio a game studio needs to have the wherewithal to make a lot of games mm -hmm. and buy a lot of movies on the market. What do you what do you think, Eric? I mean, you have are people still coming in saying I'm doing social games like they were last year or the year before? Not anymore. I mean, and it is hit driven, right? I mean, they're trying to milk the vills for as right. far as they can go, but at some point, I mean, those are going to be declining. They are declining, yeah. so they need to come up with new hits and and that's not trivial to do. It almost feels like what's happening in the movie business because in the movie business if whatever you make in the first like three weeks is like how the movie's gonna do, right? There's DVD yeah. and whatever, but it's so all riding on that like initial pop. And so with the purchase, and I'll give two disclaimers. One, I'm friends with Mark and he's an investor in Mahalo and we've known each other for a decade. Um, went to each other's weddings, whatever, we're, we're, we're friends. Um, and I bought 10,000 shares on the program when it hit $3.05 or $0.10 cents or something. Yeah, it's below and 3 I, again right now. And it's, I actually think today is a, it's yeah, it's a 250 bad. right now, 248 yeah. So um, I'm a fan of Mark's. Obviously, it's hard to see this happening to him. Um, and I sent them an email saying, like, hey, keep your chin up. But they have a billion dollars in revenue. They have a billion five in assets and cash, the building and the cash. They make a billion dollars a year. They have a billion five. And their market cap is $1.88 billion right now. So if you take out the cash, you're saying the enterprise value of the company is $300, hundred, yeah. $300 million. Yeah. And it's got a billion in revenue. A billion in revenue, $300 million. Instagram, a billion dollars, and no revenue. No revenue yeah. they, have 300, they had a 311 monthly active uniques last month. Yep. 311 monthly active uniques. Facebook has a billion. AOL has whatever, 150 million uh, or 100 million maybe. Yahoo maybe has three or 400 million. You know, like, this is a very large, significant company that is absolutely getting destroyed. And I think it's just the pricing of these IPOs was so off. The market was so hot. And they just started out, if, they, if, they, if it had gone public at 6 or $7, I bet you this wouldn't have happened. But at $15, $16, going public, $14, $15, $16, and all this buildup, I blame a lot of this on the secondary market and there's like private transactions. And we, it's so funny, we talked about it on the program when they were happening. And remember I said yep. like, these are the IPOs. And these prices, now when they go public, what's left for the public Yeah, but you know what? Get? The bankers milked every last dollar out of Zynga. The and bankers Facebook. milked and everything Facebook, out of yeah. Facebook, right? It was brilliant. This is textbook how to take, you know, the, the rich get richer, the poor, I know, but it's short-term thinking, because now are these companies, now is Zynga, because Zynga's obviously worth more than it's trading at right now. People are essentially betting that Zynga goes to zero, or Zynga goes to 300 million right now. That's the bet. Yeah. Do you think that bet's right, Eric? It seems undervalued. I mean, but, but again, it's such a hit-driven business. They need to come up with new hits, right? Right. Um, but, but it seems like it's, it's a pretty low price right now, pretty good deal. Yeah, I mean, it's like even the games, yes, the games are having a shorter half-life, and there's more competition, right, of course, but now they're going into other markets. Yeah. So it would see, but, you know, I guess a lot of this also is, there's a little bit of uh, karma going on, I think. I think Mark has been such a hardcore business guy with repricing people's options or whatever, or changing their amount of options, and just, you know, the 
relentless copying of other people's games that Zynga did. And obviously, yeah. everybody does that in this business, like the old, like in the movie business. Follow the hits. Just, they just all follow the hits. So it's like, yeah. oh, you had a great film yeah. about vampires, and everybody's got to do a vampire film. So, you know, it's probably a little bit nasty to us in our business, but in games, that's sort of how it goes, just like in movies. But I think what's happening now is people are unfairly punishing him for this sort of perception of Zynga as like a bad company. And now it's, at this price, shouldn't Marissa or Facebook just come in and buy Somebody it? Somebody buy it, yeah. Well, I think you're right, too, about the <clears throat> IPO price in the secondary markets, right? Stuff has gotten so bid up in the secondary market that, it, you know, without a lot of transparency and a lot of folks getting in at prices that they shouldn't have been getting in at. So right. I think the secondary Group market Groupon was another one that just went crazy yeah. in the secondary market. Now look at them. Yep. And then I guess Twitter is the next one with $8 billion. And that's why Twitter's yeah. probably pushing off going public as long as possible. Matthew, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you mentioned Twitter. I mean, I think that, that Twitter is definitely dragging their toes until they get their balance books in order. But, um, you know, the, this initial pop era of IPOs needs to go away for a lot of reasons, obviously. But, um, I mean, I think Facebook's IPO, as much as people are criticizing it, was handled beautifully by, you know, everybody involved on, the, on their side of things. And I think Zynga's definitely wasn't, but why is that? I do because think that Zynga is a strong. I do think that Zynga is a strong company, and people are undervaluing it hands down easily. Yeah, but why do you think Facebook did their IPO correct and um, Zynga well, did it wrong? Got because what they wanted out of their IPO. You know, they got their cash. They got they got it handled. Now, I I I am unfortunately not as well versed on the the intricacies of you know, what, whether they did the right thing ethically or not and in the back end helping the stock and all that. So I can't comment on that. But I, I do know that in the end, Facebook got their value out of their stock. And the huge pop thing is it's an unnatural state, right? I mean, we all, we've always known it's an unnatural thing, but it's become expected because it happens every time. But in Facebook's case, it, that pop didn't happen. So everybody treated that as an automatic bad thing. But in reality, it just means that it was priced correctly at least initially. And the, and the two stocks track almost identically, which is incredible. Zynga down 70% year to date, Facebook down 45% year to date. Uh, it, it's amazing. They track almost in sync. They were, I, and in fact, they were exactly in sync. And then there was this bifurcation, I guess, in June where Zynga just took a much bigger hit than Facebook did. Um, I think people quit farming this summer because it got a little too hot. <laughs> it got a little too hot in the summer. Yeah, I mean, I wish Mark the best. I hope it works out. And I think that, you know, everybody's looking at that secondary they did, and he sold $200 million in shares or whatever. Oh, my God, they all just flushed it. They, they didn't know this was coming. Nobody expects this, right, Eric? I mean. I wouldn't think this dramatic. Yeah. No. And, and, the, and the revenue picture, how much exactly did they change the 2012 estimate? Was it? It wasn't by much. It was like. Somewhere around five, ten percent. The range, was right? Lower. It just shows you how, you know, finicky Wall Street is. Like, if something is off five percent, they just do not want to be involved in it because I think what they're used to is when something goes down five percent, it's a much more likely scenario that it's going to continue <clears throat> to do, the problem is going to continue to get worse. Right, the problem typically doesn't all of a sudden yeah. rebound. I think they're interpreting a trend. It's not the five percent. It's the right it's the direction. downward trend. Yeah, it's the trend. And so, is the downward trend that I just railed on Facebook that people don't want to hang up, hang out in Facebook? Zynga's problem is Facebook's problem, which is Facebook as an ecosystem and a place to hang out is getting ickier and ickier. Nobody wanted to be on AOL, right? At a certain point, it's just like with these social networks and these things, you just people don't want to be there. Yeah. And is there any solution? Because Facebook now, Eric, has to raise revenue and earnings, right? They have to make more money. So now they start doing garbage things like promote your engagement, promote your, you know, baptism, whatever, birthday. Pro I mean, self-promotion is the death of, like, social networks like this. And then yeah. to get people to pay, to try to beg for $7 from their billion members, like... It's, and, it seems like such a <clears throat> such a departure from where they were, you know, six years ago, right? When when Zuck would summarily, you know, fire people or wouldn't even interview them, would walk out of an interview if they were pressing them on revenue, right? Um, and now to get to the point where they're sort of hawking promoted, you know, promote oh, your engagement. It's uh, so it's, cheap. It's like. You know, 180 degrees different from what well, they're. We're not going to get rid of this, was. though, because look at Maps now. When you do a Google Maps search, oh. there's promoted 
content that's inside there. Stop. That's killing me. Yeah, Google's yeah. got to stop that. Like literally, let me pay five dollars a year for my map product yep. and take the damn ads off of it. That is the stupidest move on Google's part. And Google is crushing it now in terms of revenue. The stock's at an all-time high. Seven hundred fifty bucks is Google or something. I mean, the the chart you really want to look at is Google versus Facebook, and it was hysterical. Two years ago on this program, three years ago, everybody's telling me how Facebook is going to crush Google. And I said, I don't know if I would bet against Google. They've got this really established business that, like, like clockwork, keeps growing. Yeah, utility. Yeah. And Facebook's is totally unproven. And look at this bifurcation here. You had just at the beginning of the year, obviously they start out at the same. And Google and everybody takes a little dip when the market had its little correction in May or whatever. And then Google, let me do year to date because it's even better. Oh, you know what? You can't. You got to do it from the April. Um, April IPO, um, but since Facebook's IPO, there Google's up 23 percent. Facebook down 45. That's a 75 wow. point swing in six months. Yeah, so, Facebook is going to have zero impact on Google. And this is when all the people said Google doesn't have to worry about social. Remember, all the people said like, why is Google even doing Google Plus? They should just skip social. And I was like, well, it's not going to cost them that much. They might as well try. I think those people are turning out to be geniuses. Like, why even bother with the social network if they're these transient places that, yeah, people spend a lot of time on them, but they're so hard to monetize. Yeah. Well, and the second you try to monetize them, you look like you're just interrupting people at a dinner party. Mm -hmm. with but they're, ads. they're taking what Circles did and they're bringing it into Google Chat now. So there's Hangouts, uh, part of Gchat. So you can bring. It's, a, it, it's interesting to watch how they build all these properties and then they just shuffle them around, move them into other elements. I'm surprised that Facebook yeah, That's something that Google's not good at is like the cross-product integration, integration is terrible yeah, at Google. Yeah. Well, and social, they just haven't really... They're like, yeah, local and Zagat social. is part of Google Plus. I'm like, it is? Yeah. Like when they did that one, I was like, why is Zagat being, Zagat being put inside of Google Plus? Shouldn't that be part of... Force, force people into the platform, right? Nobody was there. No, that was a terrible yeah. idea. Yeah. I'm shocked that Facebook hasn't done anything around search. I mean, I think it feels well, like to me that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, sort of. But that feels like a it's, a. it's a very small kind of. Well, they did the edges say in the, I mean, in the Mike Arrington interview, Zuck said search is something they're going to get to. And, and Cheryl confirmed that this and week. And Cheryl confirmed it this week. Which either, and I've always said they're going to do it, but th is that, Matthew, do you think that he said that in a premeditated way? in order to get the stock to go up and get people excited again? Or did Mike get Mike Arrington get him to sort of slip up and mention that? And then Cheryl said, oh, the stock went up when you talked about it. Let's talk about it more. And in, let, the market seems to like that concept. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good point, because Mike is pretty good at that. But um, he's been pretty measured. I mean, you can tell he's been working with speech coaches and presentation coaches massively over the past year. I mean, he's definitely a lot better presenter now than he has been. Um, so maybe maybe it was calculated. Maybe it was a, a move to say let's just put this just put this out there. Let's just drop this. Um, you know, it, it's definitely something that they could approach differently than Google because they have such a an immense graph of, of connections between people. Um, they can deliver search results that may be personal in a different way. So I mean, I could definitely see the pitch for it. It's just. It's like Apple taking on Maps. I mean, there's just so much work there that I'm not sure if they even realize it internally. You know, it's just well, it's if like they a, do realize it internally, they wouldn't do it. I mean, if you understand exactly right. how hard it is to do, you wouldn't do it. As a matter of fact, Microsoft, I don't think would do Bing a second time after all the losses and pain in the ass it's been for them. I don't know that they would actually go after it again. Let's do the next story. Okay, so another story you're interested in the Craigslist. Uh, Pad mapper, three taps sort of situation. Craigslist quietly launched Map View, Map View this week, so you can actually see live apartment listings on an area map. You can zoom in for detail and ho hover over individual listings. They look like uh, Craigslist peace signs, and they'll have a little pop up with the info about the uh, apartment or the house. And so we saw it first earlier this week in Portland. Uh, as of yesterday, San Francisco. Uh, the maps are powered by a company called Leaflet, which does open source. Um, it's an open source library for maps. And as we know, Craigslist had sent a cease and desist to PadMapper over the summer, and it's now suing three taps for copyright infringement, three taps is countersuing for anti-competitive behavior. So, I mean, just from a product basis, I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Is the Craigslist map view uh, good, better, or worse than what PadMapper was doing before? And 
you know, Craigslist has been around for forever in internet terms. Why is it taking this long for startups to force Craigslist to actually do something innovative? What do you boys think? Man, PadMapper was the coolest mashup. It's just when I moved to LA, it was it was working really well for me to try and find a place as I was figuring out the communities. Yep. And um, for them to, it was a weird smackdown because they wouldn't let you use it on mobile, which I thought was even better. I could be in a, a neighborhood restaurant, I could click on the PadMapper mobile link and then see all the places nearby. Right, obvious feature. Yep, so great. But the, um, yeah, when you when you bite the ecosystem that feeds you, how does that work? And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's frankly disappointing, right? I mean, Craigslist has always positioned itself as this, uh, uh, you know, almost as a uh, a utility and a community service in some sense, but yet they won't open it up to folks who are trying to build on top of it and build better products as part of that community service. So it, it's a little bit. Um, disingenuous of themselves to position themselves as, as this kind of community service, but not let other folks build on top of it. It kind of reminds me of the days of RSS readers, right, Jason? Yeah. You're, you're, you know this. Remember when, when people were aggregating news and news page and all this stuff? Even yeah. Drudge Report had these issues, right? Yeah. And then when RSS got ad insertion within the feeds, that gave RSS readers a little more life. But I guess who does RSS anymore? Right. And it's it goes, I think it speaks to, I think your point, um, is, Dave, um, building on another platform. Like, if you build a feature for some other big entity and you're successful, you've basically told them, build that feature. Yep. Oh, well, eBay had this, too. Think of all the companies eBay shut out that would help you list ads and host photos. Um, even PayPal, right? They yeah. did their own bill pay. And yeah, and they're just PayPal. like, yeah. it's not even working, though. It's very weird. I just went to apartments, and I'm, I did, like, a three-bedroom search, and it's coming up with zero results. It makes no sense. Huh. Anyway, Matthew, what do you think? I mean, actually, I read about this first on the the next web. I think they broke the story. Yeah, yeah, I, um, they did a good job taking care of that. I mean, I, the, we've been following this for a while, obviously, since the Pad Mapper thing dropped, and I mean, I think it popped up on Hacker News, and we picked it up from there and ran with it and did some research into it. And obviously, Craig has a history of kind of being very, very protective um, on the on the web and desktop of Craigslist's. API and and of or of its of its data um, on, on mobile strangely enough he doesn't really touch it so people that build mobile apps with Craigslist data there hasn't been a whole big history there of him going after them but on the web or desktop he will aggressively pursue it and and go after them and shut them down um, obviously with padmapper there seems to be this you know obvious like hey I was already building this so he wants them to shut down. But I just don't see, I don't know. I mean, it, it, in, one, in one aspect, obviously shutting a, a competitor down like that is going to look very, very, very bad. Um, and it does look bad. And it is bad for him in general. But it, it's, it's definitely, if you've got a weak product building team or you're not confident in your ability to deliver a Class A product, what do you do? You limit the competition. That's my feeling on it. Yeah, I agree. And I think... Craig has just wanted to keep the business small, and I think he's a fan of like not changing interfaces. And with all the scraping going on, we had the founder uh, and the CEO of Tap Three or Three, Three Taps. Taps, Three Taps on the program. And his the interesting argument he had was, listen, you cannot uh, copyright facts. Facts are facts. People tried to do it with phone books; they can't. And if I can get your, if I can get those facts, however I get them, scraping, whatever. And you know, we had um, Gil from. Uh, What's Gil Elbin's is a company? Factual. Factual. We had Gil from Factual on, and he said the same thing to me. Facts are facts. You can't copyright facts. Now, what you can do is you could sue somebody for hammering your servers yep. and ripping this data off of it. And you, if you win that or lose that, I don't know that that, I don't know that that's ever gone to trial. So I would be interested in if a judge would say, well, if you put it out there in the public, and then you go scrape my website, and they say, oh, well, on my terms of service say you can't scrape my website. Well, and the judge will say, well, you don't get to have that. Twitter sells this as the firehose feed. Right. Right? So there's ways to monetize your data. Right. And if you, but if Twitter says, and tw if Twitter says you can't, and I scrape their servers, I guess they could sue me for, you know, the load bearing on their servers mm -hmm. and breaking the terms of service. But terms of, just because you have a terms of service doesn't mean it's legally binding. And then additionally, what they said, that 3Tap is going to search engines and other places that are syndicating Craigslist and indexing it, because Craigslist lets itself be indexed. Yeah, yeah by Google. Others, by yeah. Google. And they're just taking the abstract. And nice. they only need the abstract, because Google is so smart that they put in the abstract 
the most relevant information, like the bedrooms and the amount. So they just pull that information only. I love it. They could even take the cached version from Google, right? I mean, well, that's what they, I asked him, and he was like, "Yeah, we could do that too." He was a little, you know, circumspect about circumspect. Is that right? Sure. Sure. He was a little, uh, you know, unclear about how they did it, but he, yeah. he did say they got it from Google and other places. Yeah, because Google's got cached version, full cached version. Full cached versions, days. unless you say cache off, right? Yeah. And you can turn the cache off. So, um, interesting. And it, I guess, what this is going to do is we're going to see Craigslist start adding more and more features. Hopefully. I think they should charge, they should have an API, and they should just charge a very generous amount yeah. for it. Like, just make it expensive. Like, it's up to 10,000 queries a day is free. Once you get over 10,000, or whatever 1% or 2% of listings is, then you have to pay 10 cents a listing. Yeah. It, and make it exorbitant, you know? And But the only way they're making money is job postings, right? Right, but the and API, Pad, if PadMapper, then PadMapper would have to come and say, like, and I would just go to PadMapper and say, how much are you making per year? But look at we what, want 50%. So in LA, That's how I do it. I'd say, I just want to say, Pat Member, whatever money you make, we want 50%, and it's a year-over-year -year deal, and we renegotiate every year, and you have to give us your complete revenue. But I'd pay 20 bucks, just like Carfax, um, Westside Rentals here in Los yeah. Angeles. They have set themselves to be great services, yeah. and you'll pay you know, for two months, three months, however much time you need for mm -hmm. these things. So, yeah, All right, let's move on. on. Yeah. Let's move on. Next story. And then, Matthew, you have anything to add? What's that? Anything to add to the mapping? Uh... No, no. I mean, I think it's. I think it definitely. We're going to see more features for Craigslist, but if it moves at the, the pace that he has been moving, it's going to be a long time before we see the next one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear who's going to win this battle long term. It's not going to be Craig. It's going to be the people doing the scraping and facts for facts kind of right. people are going to win. And it's just yeah. a matter of you know how how Craig can catch up and fight the you know barbarians at the gate off. Next story. All right, Jason. Just so. Two more stories. Let's talk about uh, the TripAdvisor acquisition of Wanderfly. Uh, we talked about this on our own yep. little news discussion earlier this week, but for the benefit of everyone else. So financial terms were not disclosed. This is TripAdvisor's first acquisition in 2012. Wanderfly actually came out with a 2.0 at the launch festival this year. Yep. Uh, it kind of has a, a Pinterest look and feel. Yep. Um, Wonderfly did raise $1.4 million from Charles River Ventures, Dave Morin, and our very own Jason over here. And, of course, we know TripAdvisor is a huge company, $4.75 billion market cap. Yep. So I guess for you guys, where is the social travel space headed, and was this a good outcome for Wonderfly? Um, I can't talk to specifics of the deal because I'm in the deal, obviously. I you know, have a responsibility there, but um, it's a great team, and places like TripAdvisor need teams like this who are building cutting-edge products. And so I think for TripAdvisor, this is a really awesome deal. Um, you know, as an angel, you always want to see people go big and keep pushing. But you have to be, as an angel, I have to, you know, at, be at peace with the fact that I don't get to decide the fate of the company. And I have investors in my company. And they can have an influence over that. But as a small investor, you don't really have much influence, right? We've so. got a TripAdvisor guy right here. Oh, you do? Yeah, I was VP of product at TripAdvisor a oh, okay. long time ago. Let's but, hear it. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think... You know, I don't know the numbers on Wonderfly, but uh, so I don't know if it was a good deal for them or not, frankly. But uh, I have to imagine this was mostly kind of a talent acquisition at this point. Their traffic was still pr really small, and uh, beautiful product, great team, uh, and a, you know, a great pickup for TripAdvisor. I think, like you said, I think social, no one's really cracked as far as travel goes, uh, and it's a tough category. You know, it's a tough, it's a very expensive category to drive traffic. Um, there's it's a lot of hard. money sloshing around. There's a lot of revenue sloshing. You know, In the hotel side, right? Hotels, and that's where TripAdvisor always had strength. I yeah. mean, we you don't always, make any money off the flights. Yeah, air the flights sucks. Consider no money in air. Air is a broken Four industry. Four bucks, and, five bucks a ticket, right? Yeah, be best. I mean, best case. Yeah. yeah, so hotels is where all the money is, and that's where TripAdvisor's been strong. So I think anyone that figures out social travel is going to have a great business, but nobody's cracked it yet. But hmm. Wonderfly, I mean, built a beautiful product, and um, it's a great team, so I think it's a great pickup for TripAdvisor. Hmm. All right, next story. Last All one. right, uh, let's talk about Google introducing its new ad format, Lightbox. So you guys might have known that this was Ad Week in New York. Um, it's a standard ad size, yep. and if you hover over it for two seconds, it'll expand into one of those super-sized kind of takeovers, and advertisers will only pay when the ad is expanded. And they claim that this smart hover <coughs> has eliminated nearly 100% of accidental expansions. Um, you, of course, can put YouTube videos, games, photos, whatever you like in those expanded ads, and they are claiming that this has very uh, high return on investment. $1 invested delivered a $1.70 return in sales. They're saying it's 2.4 times more effective than a TV ad spend. So I know 
display advertising is not the sexiest business in the world. Did Google actually do something to reinvent it? And will this work on mobile? They haven't launched it on mobile yet. Yawn, yawn, yawn. Remember mm -hmm. in the year 2000 when there were JavaScript ads, you could play yeah. games, things would yeah. pop up a slide. Those were so aggravating. Yeah. And then there was pop-ups to make them even more aggravating. What, uh, well, I mean, advertising has to be disruptive in order to be effective, yeah. correct or not? Yeah. Correct, but with targeting, we could do better. We could we could look at uh, the heuristics of what I'm doing. And well, I mean, they are targeting. I, mean, I just got Hiscox ads and Samsung ads. Right. You yeah, know, that, because I had been to the Hiscox website and they're retargeting me, and I got a Samsung ad because I was on an Apple search for yeah. Steve Jobs. You know, it's like we are doing the retargeting. So for me, if that was a retarget of the Hiscox ad or the Squarespace ad, and I had been on this week in startups or I watched the video. Like, to me, that would be great that it popped open and I got a little bit more information and it was beautiful. So I, but that's cool, but there's yeah. nothing more aggravating than moving your mouse across a page or just... Well, they said two seconds, right? right it doesn't right. go... It, oh, it, you have yeah, to be over, to over two over seconds. It's not like that. I agree with you. There's some people who are doing this thing where, like, on Business Insider, like, which I don't even go to anymore now that we have, like, the ticker do going. I used to go to Business Insider, Tech Meme, Tech Crunch, like, all the time, yeah. like, 10 times a day each or five times a day, five times a day each. Now I just watch, you know, launchticker.com, and I don't even go to it but once a day just to see if my writers happen to miss something that I would have liked. But, oh, God, when you hover over something and it takes over your page. Yeah, oh. yeah disruptive works, but it's not ideal. Oh. Right? I think relevant is a lot better. So relevant, right. relevant, relevant is what really works. Right? Look at AdWords. I mean, yeah. that, that works. And but. the retargeting seems to be working brilliantly. Like, I'm getting yeah. followed all over the web for stuff that I search for. It is amazing. Like... You, I, I, things I'm looking at on Amazon, I'm then getting retargeted to on you know yeah. other sites. I, I thought mean, you use Disconnect, Jason. I do. Yeah, sometimes so, I use it, sometimes I don't. It depends. Okay, okay yeah. so you're not. Uh, sometimes I, the thing about Disconnect, the way I use it is I'll have it off, uh, I'll have it on, and then I will turn it off like for certain sites and stuff like that. So I use it on and off depending. Is that a Firefox um, Chrome plugin? It's a Chrome or? thing that just takes out the the. The really the, annoying part about it is. Sometimes I do want to have that plus one button there. So what I wish is, I wish it would have the plus one button there and just, gr it puts like another like plain box. But what I want to do is still see the button, but have the button neutered. So when I press the button, and I got to talk to Brian about this, then it like actually re does the button and then I can click it. Hmm. You know, so I can still see the button because yeah, I forget that, oh, I want a Google Pluses. But I use this thing called Buffer now. But anyway, the really interesting thing that I heard was Google on YouTube you know the skip the ads, the five seconds? Yeah, yeah. Every ad has that now. I don't think you can run an ad on YouTube without that. Matthew, I don't know if you want to look that up or if it's true or not. But you can't look at an ad without getting that five-second skip. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me the creative on Google YouTube is now like 1,000% better, and the drop-off rates have totally leveled off. So the, the, because the advertisers don't have a choice, it's the publisher's choice to, ha to allow that. Uh-huh. Or maybe it's not even the publisher's choice. I think they just force it on everybody. The creative has gone, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but the first five or ten seconds of every video on YouTube is really clever now and yeah. smart and fun and bright. It's not like these boring, ugly ads. Creative's going to have to get better. If so you're saying people aren't clicking the skip button because the ads are so awesome on exactly. YouTube? Exactly. Nah. <laughs> Exactly. No, some of them are. Some of them okay. you don't even realize it's an ad and they're starting. It, it feels like a YouTube video right. or like a Vimeo video. Like it starts out with like, there was somebody doing bike tricks, and I'm watching this bike tricks thing last night, and it's for like a man grooming Gillette, like, uh, what do you call those things? Manscaper. Hair trimmer. A a manscaper. manscaper. Yeah, but this manscaper is incredible. <laughs> this manscaper, like, it's got a digital readout. So you can make like uh, instead of like it's like a one two or three to buzz yeah. your hair. Dial, dial. You can in, dial right? in like yeah. one point four, uh, one point three awesome. five. Like you're literally, it's got a digital readout. I don't know what it's called. Wait, was this the ad or the video you were watching? Well, the video. Um, uh, what is this hair trimmer? No, it wasn't a Gillette hair trimmer. God, I'll never be able to guess this because I saw it on YouTube. But anyway, the point is, it was it was an ad for this hair trimming thing, and. It was a guy doing freestyle, like, biking. You know, like those, what do you call that, biking? BMX. X BMX, BMX. BMX. Yeah. It was like freestyle BMX. And it was sick. Sick, sick, sick. Like, the craziest, like, through San Francisco stuff. And I watched the whole thing. Freestyle BMX. Let's see if it's in the ad spots here. No. It was so crazy, this thing. Like, this guy was doing, 
the best tricks I've ever seen, like parkour style, like through nice. the streets of San Francisco. So I think everybody's moving their ads to that. It's just going to all be content with, you know, a little bit of advertising embedded in the content. Throw some James Earl Jones voiceover and boom, got an ad. Well, no, it's, I mean, look at this show. It's like, I'm, I'm going to read you an ad for two products I really like and that I use. And it yeah, that's talk feel radio. Like it. that's... It's talk radio, but I think that's what's going to on YouTube is like, it's going to be, if you're going to, you know, promote your product to me, whatever it is, a phone or whatever, it better be funny or interesting or beautiful or relevant, like it's, or people are going to skip. Yeah. But because television came out of radio, remember the Colgate Palm Olive Comedy Hour? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And you'd have the same situation. So we're just going back. What do you back think about time. the Lightbox, Matthew? Matthew, Lightbox and YouTube skip ahead. What do you think, Matthew? Well, I mean, the, I mean, the pre-roll thing I have a thought on, too, but the, as far as the light box goes, the, what stood out to me was that they really stressed that this eliminates nearly 100% of accidental expansions, right? So the accidental click thing, I think, is becoming a major problem, especially on mobile. So I would look for new ad products from Google to be concentrating on fixing that problem a lot more. Because that, I think, is a big, big issue that a lot of a lot of ad buys are concentrating on, and I think Google is looking to to assuage those fears that you know these people are not getting accidental clicks; they're getting true clicks. Um, but as far as the true view stuff, the pre-roll, I mean, that's the whole reason Google um, was fine with Apple, you know, kicking their YouTube app off. I mean, they released their YouTube app with their own pre-roll ads on the iPhone, yep. which is where they get a massive amount of YouTube views, mobile, you know, probably more than Android, if I, if the usage numbers are any, you know, uh, identifier. Yeah, of course. So I think that they're they're hot on the true view, and I think that it doesn't mean like back in June of 2011, I think they they said that um, like 30% of all people watched the ads. And 30% is, uh, in anybody in ads knows that's enormous. You yeah. Know? Um, so, I mean, it, I think it's definitely good. And I'm with you. I have watched them. And one of them was like an entire performance from a concert. And I, I watched the whole thing for yeah. like, you know, seven minutes or whatever. All right, Matthew, watch this for a second. Tell me what you think. Concentrate. Oh, share. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Watch it. A great nation. All right, did you get that? Basketball, dance floors, dance floors, and a great nation. What is, what do these three things have in common? Basketball. Uh-huh. Dance floors. Dance floors. And a great nation. Uh -huh. Yeah, I feel like this is like, what was the other uh, They're bit? like chairs. What was, the, what was the bit on Johnny Carson where you Kreskin? Oh, yeah. <laughs> chairs. <laughs> a great nation. <laughs> and dance floors. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't know, they all involve more than what one is? person? I have no idea. <laughs> what, what is. is Douche space. What is a priest, a rabbi, and a. Uh, 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 whatever. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Let me do this. It's so great. Cres was it Kreskin? I think it was Kreskin. I think so. I think Kreskin, right. Johnny Carson. For the kids who are watching this who have absolutely no idea what Kreskin is. <laughs> Do kids watch No, it Mad wasn't Kreskin. What was this? It was Schwarmy? What was this? What did they call that? When he wore the... Um... Does someone in chat know this so we can get the show done? <laughs> Karnak. 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 Karnak the Magnificent. Here we go. <laughs> watch this, everybody, for those people who don't know. Well, watch the 17-second ad. Look at that ad. So cute. So cute. cute. You're not going to skip that. Pets but look, no skip. Make your dog 17 seconds, no skip. With our look great guarantee, you're happy or it's free. PetSmart, happiness in store. Yay, PetSmart. All right, here we go. For kids who don't know what, what, what bit we're doing. We should do this on the show. This is hysterical. Tyler and I did this. I like that he walked the wrong way when he came out. Yeah. Which I hold in my hands the envelopes. Here's the envelopes. <laughs> Envelope number one. Envelope number one. I think that's a publisher at clearinghouse check. Yeah. Ready? He'll divine the answer to this question. Yes. Have you never? <laughs> Snoopy and Woodstock. Snoopy and Woodstock. <laughs> 
who's running the state of California while Jerry Brown is out campaigning for president. <laughs> Yes, go, 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 Thank you for tuning in to This Week in Startups. What an amazing program, Matthew, Dave. <sighs> Before we jump, there was one other. The, I think the coolest thing Google did this week was their new Google Wallet Pay per viewing of content. But with the twist to it, did oh, you see Oh, look at this? Tyler all of a sudden woke up. Yeah. Yes. What was that, Tyler? <laughs> Explain. Yeah. Google, the microtransaction. The microtransaction paywall for content, but with a unique twist, which <clears> is... You can say if you weren't happy or not with the content, and you would get an instant refund. Um, Look, the thirty had... second. If you didn't like the paywall, you can go back. Yes. They had to do something because no one was using Google Wallet. <laughs> I, I still have. I bought an Android phone. I still have twenty five bucks in that account that I can't spend. I've actually tried to spend it. And Harry McCracken, my buddy, um, the writer, he said he tried to live for a month on Google Wallet. And he said most of the time his wife just uh, paid cash for what they needed to do. Yeah, go Google Wallet is just terrible. I don't know why they couldn't make that work. Um, but yeah, I thought this is a really interesting idea. I, I hope it works, but micropayments have never worked. And in the 90s, we used to talk about micropayments all the time. In your web browser would be a certain amount of money. Internet Explorer was thinking about doing it. Everybody was thinking about doing it. And you'd pay a penny per page or a tenth of a penny. Perhaps yeah. one of the most talked and, about concepts that never really came. And the reason, never even you know close. the reason why? Yeah. Why? The reason why was cognitive. It required a decision, and the cognition required to make a decision every time you looked at an article was so annoying to people that they were just like, screw it, I'm not going to do it. They have to make a decision. What this does is it's like, oh, well, if it's just a couple of pennies, and I, if I click on, if they really make it that easy that you can just click on something and say refund, it's got to be flawless, which is it should go ding, and it should put like one cent on the top right of your browser, and then you should be able to just click it and say refund. Dink. And what's going to happen is people are going to feel guilty. What I like about this idea and why I think it has a 5% chance of working, whereas other micropayments had a 0% chance of working or 0.1%, is that if there was no, if there's an instant refund, you might just be like, oh, it's like a donation, and you might feel okay about it. And you're not going to have that cognitive dissonance. Well, what about Copper, the folks we had at the launch festival? Right, and Copper I liked because that was donation yeah. only. You Literally weren't you're forced to pay. Thing. It was only on the donation side. So Copper, yeah. which is a great example, was another thing that I think those things could work, and if it really is truly just one click, one touch. And I mean, look at something like um, Kickstarter. Like That idea was out there 15 years before it, and people wrote a... The street performer was like... Somebody had written this paper, The Street Performer, or something like that, and how... Street performers could do this, like as a technique. Yep. The public street performer, public. You remember this paper? Yeah. Somebody did a paper basically around this concept of Kickstarter, and then other people tried to implement Kickstarter. Groupon started as a Kickstarter as well. Yeah, it was a community-based uh, message board. So and, that, but let's go back in time to 1998. Do you remember? Whoopi? Things can change, is my point, in commerce, and things something has fundamentally changed in commerce with Groupon and with Kickstarter. So it could fundamentally change in the payment for content. It could, if executed well. Remember in 98 New York, Whoopi Goldberg had ads all over? Flues! Yep, there it is. Flues! Oh, yeah. Earn your flues dollars. <laughs> awesome. Uh, flues. What's old again is new. I think, and she also, what, didn't she diss it at some point? She, like, didn't know what it was. I think that was the problem. Like, they hired Whoopi for millions of dollars, and she didn't know what it was. I wish we had a flues commercial. Ugh. Flues, Whoopi. Look at we other people. young kids who probably don't remember that one either, Jason. Yes, I know. God, things for people are old. All right. Anyway, uh, Matthew, you have any thoughts about uh, the Google payment system? You can put it on uh, the next web. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it just it isn't anything yet. It's just all amorphous, and they haven't figured out how to make it indispensable. And until they do, then it'll just be nothing. It'll be a side project. Yeah, I mean, people would. It would be really cool if it was integrated into YouTube, where it'd be like, oh, I could watch this video or movie, and it cost a dollar. I'd pay a couple cents to get rid of an ad. Because when what, I go to YouTube, yeah, what if it was a dollar and then you just said at any point during the first, whatever, ten percent of the video, you could click refund. Or if you bail out of the video, if you quit watching. If you quit watching, that's a great idea. Yeah. That would be amazing. I need to patent this right now. You mother go. effer with your patents. You stop go. with those patents. I gotta I, go. I told you with those patents. <laughs> no, this would be a great patent, though. You're right. I'm gonna. I wait, pat, wait, I on. patent wait, first. Wait, I, I gotta... patent <laughs> first. I drew it, and here it is. There's the schematic. I get it before um, you. Yeah, you have no Greg? patent. Okay, Hold on. yeah. So we need to. Uh, to rate start, the wait, I need you to, to write Everybody this up Everybody knows I came right up now. with it first. I have the video. <laughs> I, I made it better. Video. I'm editing the video. I made it better. I'm editing the video. I had the idea first. No, but imagine you're watching your television, and all the pay-per-view channels were there. 
You could start anything, and the first 10 minutes of the movie were free. And when it got to the 10-minute mark, it went, charging your card in 10, 9, change channel, 8. Well, four. DirecTV does this. They, they show do you this the pay-per-view, actually. The first few minutes, and uh, then you hit yeah. the button. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So this, somebody does have the patent, apparently. They may not have the patent, but they're doing it. Somebody's doing it. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Hiscox. Everybody follow Hiscox Small Biz on uh, their Twitter accounts. Go ahead and thank them uh, for their support of the program. Thank you at Squarespace. Thank you, Eric, Dave, Matthew, Tyler, Kieran, Brandis, everybody. And hey, I, when was Carolyn's last day? It was Tuesday. I wasn't here. You were here. I didn't see her. She didn't say goodbye. Hey, Carolyn, if you're listening, gosh, thanks for all the... Do you really the, uh... think she's listening? No. No. Okay. No, she's at home. But it was nice. It was good. It was... Um, no, Carolyn. no, I, I would like have to liked to Carolyn. say goodbye on the air, but Carolyn. if she wasn't here, I would have brought her in great. for a second. Carolyn was great, and yeah. she's going on to do her dream and work in food and uh, be a cheese gourmand. Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what is... <laughs> Cheese and Chase and Calacanis have to do with each other. Hmm. Stinky. 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 <laughs> hmm. uh, anyway, Carolyn, thanks for all the effort. And uh, somebody on the staff just sent her a little URL here. You did a great job. You should be very proud. And we're going to miss you a whole bunch for all um, the great things you did here. We'll see everybody next time on This Week in Startups. 